This is a Stock Trade and Reality Podcast, episode 28. You can, your parents tell you to dream all the time. They tell you to dream as you grow up, you know, dream of doing all these great things. But dreaming in the market is just going to get your money taken from you like you're a child. This is the Stock Trading Reality Podcast, where you get to see the realistic side of a trader's journey. Get inspired and stay motivated by everyday normal people who are currently on their journey to trading success. And this is your host, who highly recommends not eating a big breakfast before climbing sand dunes, Clay Trader. Now, for those of you that have no experience with sand dunes, you know, that may seem like, well, that's a, a random fun fact, but if you have grown up or do, you know, live around someplace that has sand dunes and you know, these things are no joke. And I'm not talking about little 10 feet sand dunes. I'm talking about real sand dunes like we have here in West Michigan. So if you're ever in West Michigan or someplace that has sand dunes, you know, be very, very careful because if you're competitive like me, you want to get to the top and you want to get to the top before other people, which is going to cause you to exert lots of energy um, and my roast, my most recent experience, um, you know, I, I ate a little bit too much. And when I got to the top, I wasn't feeling it and I threw up all over the place. Um, and that may seem kind of dramatic, but, um, like I said, you, you just have to experience a sand dune in order to uh, really appreciate it, which, uh, is a nice little segue to bring in my esteemed co-host. Chez is his name. They call him that on the street. Um, Chess, do you have any experience with sand dunes? I mean, you grew up in Chicago, but I don't think you have those there. I did, but uh, my grandparents actually had a beach house in Indiana right next to the Indiana State Dunes, so we spent a ton of time there. And I know all about how difficult it is to climb to the top of real dunes, except I've never had the experience of actually vomiting at the top. But I have trekked up them many times. You know, The cool thing is when it snows during wintertime, we'd actually go over there and snowboard down them. But the thing that distinguishes them from, you know, going to an actual place to ski or snowboard is that there is no chairlift back to the top and you have to walk all the way back to the top. And snow and sand are two things that are not very enjoyable or easy to walk in, especially on a steep incline. So, yes, I okay. am. I'm actually quite familiar with them. I was actually going to ask you about that because I don't have any experience now that I think about it in the winter. So it's not like the snow freezes the sand and makes it your life any easier. It's still terrible. No, but still terrible. And the thing is, if the... Yeah, everything usually, you, you'll think it's nice and snowy and it looks great, but the snow might only be, I don't know, six inches, three inches deep. And then as soon as you step through, it's just like you were in sand the whole time anyways. Right. And then plus, I guess, just thinking about it in winter, you have on your big boots and stuff like that. So each leg weighs 15 pounds. Yep. So that's got to be carrying all your other stuff too. Oh yeah, it's uh, it's miserable. That's for, that's for sure. Wow. Wow. So yeah, now sand dunes are super fun. You get great views when you get to the top, but if you ever uh, have any sand dune adventures, which I would highly recommend. Well, enough talk about sand dunes. This is not the National Geographic channel. So welcome to the Stock Trading Reality Podcast. We have another great interview for you today. Uh, last week, we interviewed Cubs, and he was uh, a younger chap. And this week, we have another younger chap. I think he may be setting the record um, for the youngest guest we've had, which is good. I want to get a good little range of ages. Uh, but a good little perspective, we got into some good little... Uh, you know, perspectives on the market in terms of just some psychology and some interesting things that we've never really talked about before. Uh, so I think it's going to be very beneficial for uh, for listeners. And I mean, if you've liked all the other past podcasts, then I see no reason why you wouldn't find this one just as beneficial. So without further ado, let's talk with Mark. He goes by Z-Man in the chat room and let's uh, hear about his story. So we are here with Mark now. And like I said, he goes by Z-Man in the chat room. Mark, thanks for uh, hanging out with us today. Oh, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, I'm curious. You've been around for a while within the chat room, uh, but how long? It's been at least six months, hasn't it? No. Uh, let's see. So I would have I would have signed up in March, I believe, and uh, I went all in with the Clay Trader whole package, the CTU package, and um, I started watching the Level 2 right off the bat. But, yeah, I'm, I've been in here. Since March of 2015? I would say. Okay, yeah, um, so right about six months then, because I think my calendar oh, okay. said... Okay, yeah, so thought so. All right, awesome, man. Well, happy six months. I guess we'll start there. But um, So tell us about your journey. I mean, what even got... You're a younger guy. Are you willing to disclose your age? I'm 23. Okay, so you're 23, so you're potentially the youngest. I know last episode we had Cubs on, who was 24. 
Uh, I know Chez is like 12, so but he doesn't count. <laughs> uh, but so I mean, you're you're young, but let's go back to the start. I mean, what what even got you interested in this whole stock market thing? Okay, so I started off in uh, January of 2014 and I was um, buying physical gold and silver and that was kind of my investment thing and I was hoping that I'd be able to make some money there well the I got, price let me just did, what what even got, this is the first time buying physical silver and gold I mean what what, what made you want to do that that's uh, by far a first and for somebody younger like yourself I mean what made you decide you wanted to do that well uh, I was uh, I had some extra cash lying around, and I had did a little side business, and I was making some money there, and I wanted to put some money aside, and so I decided I was going to do that, but that didn't go real well. It was very time consuming, and uh, I was mainly buying off of eBay, and I wanted to start like scrapping, but I ended up just scrapping that whole idea. Now I'm sitting on some gold and silver that I paid way more than it is worth now. Uh, so then. Fast forward into May, I decided to look in the market. I uh, made a Scott Trade account, and I didn't actually place a trade until July. I, but once May came, I had a, you know, I just researched and researched. I familiarized myself with the terms. I, um, you know, every night I was reading things online and just looking around and. Um, you know, I wanted to really learn, make sure I had a basic understanding of what I was doing until uh, I was ready to put money on the line, and then GoPro was my first trade. Cool, cool. So you didn't actually take, you know, I know you had interest in gold or silver um, physically at that time, so you didn't actually start trading gold or silver, you know, with the, the ETFs or anything like that? You just went right to GoPro? Yeah, I, I went right to GoPro. I, was, I didn't think I was going to be a trader at first, this is the thing. Gotcha. You were just thinking this was going to be kind of like a buy and hold, uh, you know, park your money here and just watch it appreciate. Yeah, that was the plan. So, uh, so how'd that go? What, uh, you know, what what happened after you bought GoPro? Well, uh, it's funny you ask because I actually sold it for a hundred dollar loss a few days later. Uh, I freaked out. It went down a little bit after the IPO, and I dumped it because I thought it was going to zero, <laughs> and. Um, well, that's when I started, you know, reading some more. I need to see what I was doing here, and I ended up buying it back higher the next day because I was like, oh, well, now it's going back up, so I bought it. And, um, yeah, uh, ever so since you're, then. So you're basically selling when you should have been buying and buying when you should have been selling? Is that kind of the moral of the story there? Yeah, I mean, that was part of my... Um, I'd say it was a learning experience. You know, I, I learned a lot, lot since then. Um, then I've done some other, you know, stupid things. But overall, that was whenever I uh, I really showed how green my back was. I was just a, a rookie at that time. So, and, I mean, uh, sorry, just curious. Go ahead. What, what drew your attention to GoPro? What was your quote-unquote research? You know, what was your quote-unquote strategy? Was it just because... GoPro is a big name. They're having some big IPO, or was there more, like I said, research that kind of went into it? I was familiar with the uh, the CEO, um, and I well, you know, I don't, I just know of him through the internet, and I have the product, and uh, I liked it, so I decided, okay, I might as well park my money here and see what happens with it, and yeah. uh, I ended up doing good. I bought it back and then I sold it and then I ended up buying it back again on a dip and I sold it and by this time I probably had a couple hundred dollars extra than I did uh, I was probably right around five percent gain so it's pretty good and then I did some other things I want let, to let's talk about GoPro because maybe I misheard you but I thought you said that you were getting into GoPro and you were thinking you're, it was going to be yeah, I, I thought you said you no. Know, I, I wasn't planning on being an active trader. Is that were you talking about GoPro when you said that? Yes, I mean this was uh this would be several months after the IPO. Whenever oh, I started okay. trading, so it. You, yeah. so you were I'm sorry. So you bought it, and then you know multiple months went by, and then you started to trade it more actively. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. That because I, I, I was just gonna. I was curious. I mean, well, wow. That what, what changed so fast in your your mind? Where all of a sudden you went from. You know, I'm going to be an investor to an active trader, but okay, that that makes more sense. So you traded. I uh, said it sounded like you got in your groove with GoPro, uh, but 
I'm assuming something bad happened or else you would still be trading GoPro. So, I mean, what, what all happened with the GoPro trading? Well, um, I ended up getting out of GoPro completely and I, you know, I had a lim I had a limited amount of money. So really I would put all my position into one, all my cash into one position to trade it. And at, at that time, so I was trading some penny stocks and, um, uh, I knew about liquidity off the bat. I never had that problem because that was during those two months that I just studied until I um, bought GoPro. You know, I was I learned all that. I figured all that out. So I'd say it was probably like August, maybe maybe November, all, between August and November, where uh, I kind of started trading some of the things. You know, I was looking at the at the boards and seeing what people were talking about. Maybe drinking a little bit of Kool Aid, nothing too serious. Uh, I realized, you know, that if people wanted these stocks, they would, uh, you know, the price would not be a penny. It wouldn't. If people actually needed these things, felt like they needed them, they would actually be willing to pay something for it. So I, I never really had a problem as far as diving into something and getting stuck in it or overpaying. Um, yeah, I've just I've learned. I learned pretty quick. But so, do you remember what tickers uh, specifically you traded at that time, or no? Uh, one in particular was United States Enrichment Corp. I can't remember what it was because they changed the um, they changed the ticker. But ooh, a name change in penny stock yeah. that never happened. The name change, and then they're supposed to explode after that name change, right? Yeah, yeah, and they, in that market. Yeah, and they had a uh, it, it was some split. I can't remember what it was, but. I was Some split. It would be a reverse split in penny stocks. It, it was a reverse. No, no split. it was like I can't remember if it was a, a reverse or a regular split. It was like they did the price go up after the split. It did, yeah. So uh, rever there is the reverse yeah. split for you right there. So, but don't worry, Mark. They did that because they're going to uplist the New York Stock Exchange and then oh, turn everybody tried. into billionaires. So, I mean, everything will be okay with the reverse. Reverse splits are done. For progress, right, Chaz? That's that's the whole point of the, the penny stock reverse split. That's what they tell me. That is exactly <laughs> what they tell me. We're going to the moon with it. <laughs> yep, and then all of a sudden it goes back right back to being a penny stock. But uh wow. We're gonna have to uh yeah, we gotta be careful or else we could we can talk about penny stocks forever. So um now you said you were drinking a little bit of Kool-Aid. So I'm curious, what was this little bit of Kool-Aid? Because I think some people can probably relate. I think a lot of people are probably like you thinking, yeah, there's something not quite right with penny stocks, but there's just something there. Maybe, uh, I mean, what was this little bit of Kool-Aid that you were drinking? You know, mainly it was, this really is what made me decide that I needed to learn more about technical analysis. Uh, whenever they had somebody come on there and talk about all these technical terms, that I wasn't all too familiar with. You know, somebody would be talking like, uh, here it is, uh, MACD's breaking through, and uh, it's above the moving average, it's about to bounce off this moving average, that moving average, whatever. So I'm looking at the chart, and I'm trying to figure out what they're talking about, and the next thing I know, there it is, it's moving either way. You know, it may be moving where they said it was going to move, or it's moving the other way. But... I decided that I didn't want to be paper, I didn't want to be puppet trading somebody, and I didn't want to sit there and go off of what somebody else told me to do, and I needed to learn how to fish for myself. So that's whenever I kind of did, and this was probably like near February, I would say February 2015, and that's when I decided I kind of needed to really step up my, um, you know, step up my knowledge. I needed to learn. I needed to figure some things out for myself, and so I was looking on YouTube, and I, that's where I saw your clay clay trader videos, your live trading videos. And I, I'm pretty sure I watched all of them. I, I don't know if there's one I've missed. That's and, impressive because I think there's like 190 something right now at the time of this recording. So if you watch every single one, then that's literally hours upon hours. So impressive. Yeah. Uh, I, I, there was a, t a while where before I actually paid and went through with this, I was just watching those and I was just learning, you know, and I, I really like that style of trading, but I'm limited on cash. So, um, you know, now I'm looking at leveraged, uh, uh, like ETFs and ETNs and stuff like that. And now I'm, I'm curious just because I, I've, I don't know if I've ever really asked this, but you said you watched those live videos and you were learning. Um, but now I also know the rest of the story, you know, you're in clay trader university. So, 
Uh, what, is there a bit more to it than what you thought you were learning by those free YouTube videos? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Without a okay. doubt. Okay, because there's a lot of people that, yeah, you know, I'm watching your videos and I'm going to put some money in the market. I'm just thinking, oh, oh, there's so much more to it than just free YouTube videos that are out there. But, um, and I've said it before, I know I have a video out there um, entitled The Risks of Free Education. Um, so we'll put that in the show notes. Uh, but, um, you know, I'll say it again on here. Uh, those, all the free stuff I do, all the free videos I do, yes, they're, they're, you know, intended to uh, provide education, but they're also intended just to show you my style and let you know, you know, help you decide whether or not you, you like my style. But, you know, th they're not intended to uh, be what trains you to go put money into the course. There's a lot more to it. Um, and they're, they're, they're intended to kind of pique your interest. And I don't have a problem saying that. That's the point. I want to get you interested uh, in the premium training stuff. Um, but I also want to just show you my style. And uh, obviously, if you think the free videos are garbage, then definitely don't pay me for the fr premium stuff because you won't like it. But if you like my style with the free stuff, uh, you know, the, the premium stuff is uh, at the same price. So um, I'm glad you kind of brought up that point because I get I get it all the time. Yeah, those free videos. Now I'm ready to, to you know, take my kids college tuition money and put it into a penny stock. Eh, I probably exaggerated there. But um, so, yeah, very, very good point there. So um, where, where are you finding these penny stocks? You said you're reading boards. I mean, were you just, were you puppet trading or I'm just curious, what was your mentality at this point? Cause GoPro, you said, all right, you know, I've, I've heard of the company. I own the product. I, I know of the CEO, but how, what was your, you know, what was your strategy in terms of finding these penny stocks? Yeah, that's just it. You know, I was basically just puppet trading. Um, one of the biggest things I noticed is that people were coming on here and they were saying, look, buy buy here and you're going to sell here. And the thing the thing that was crazy to me is that if I'm going to buy this thing at 20 cents, what makes me think that, you know, why would somebody pay $2 next week for it? That's what kind of just, you know, that's what, if they, if they were going to pay $2 for it next week, why wouldn't they just do it right now? Why wouldn't they know about it? So I, I figured, well, something's not all here and I would just watch what they were doing. And there was one ticker that I did make shoot, it was like 60% and I had a big position, so I ended up hauling a nice piece of change out of it. And I didn't fall in love with it. These other guys were talking about, if I sell it at $3, then, oh, I'm going to retire. And uh, it goes, now, I was thinking about it a couple of days ago, and I figured y'all are going to like this. You can, your parents tell you to dream all the time. They tell you to dream as you grow up, you know, dream of doing all these great things. But dreaming in the market is just going to get your money taken from you like you're a child. It's not going to do anything for you. Yeah, that's that's mic drop. Way true, right there. Yeah, that'll that'll be in the quotes right there because that's very very true. And this, yeah, I don't think we've ever had anybody kind of really say that because yeah, that really you know there's no there's no hoping and dreaming and you know thinking about when Google goes to five million dollars how rich I'm going to be because yeah you you'll get taken um, you'll be waiting a lot of years but you know anything could happen. But um, did you ever have any you know I know you made a big chunk of change on that one ticker you traded. Did you ever have any kind of like 60% losses or, you know, did you, did you get caught in liquidity traps? You know, how, how else did it go besides that one really good one? Uh, really it was flat. That was my, that was my biggest problem. You know, I would get some, I would gain and then I would just slowly give it back, give it back. I never had a problem really holding something until it just beat me down. Uh, there was this one instance with that uranium enrichment company where I noticed the chart would go a certain way every day. It would um, rise up in the morning. I did that for like three days. Uh, no, it would start off down, go down further, and then come back up throughout the day. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to try this. Sure enough, there it did. It did it, and it went down. I bought. It went down some more. It went down more, and I was like, okay, it shouldn't be going down this more. So I Googled it. They filed for bankruptcy. <laughs> so I sold it. I sold, I lost like 600 bucks, you know, that, and that's kind of – kind of set me in a reality, you know, put me, so, put me where I knew. Yeah, so it was a lot of, like you said, just up and down, up and down, up and down, no consistency. That was essentially None. where you're at at this part. Um, yeah, no but, consistency. So, I mean, let's go back to you noticed, all right, this there's some live trade videos. I'm watching this. So then where did you go from there? I mean, did you join up uh, with the chat room at that point, or did you just kind of sit back and observe? You know, where, where kind of the things uh, transpire from here? No, at that time, I, uh, well, yeah, I mean, you could say as soon as I joined, you know, I went ahead and I made my account, uh, introduced myself to the community, 
Uh, I joined the first videos I wanted to watch was level two because all I'd hear about is people talking about level two this, level two that. And I had already paid for it to try to teach myself, but, um, you know, that, that didn't work out very well. Uh, I was paying for level two each month. I probably had it for like two months. And so that's when I decided, okay, I need to do this. I need to go ahead and go through with this. I'm, I'm really interested in this. I'm not losing money. I know that 10% of all traders lose money. No, 90, yeah, 90 only 10%. Yep, yep, yep. And I didn't lose money, you know, I'm, I'm uh, I'm positive. I was even positive those first couple of months when I first started, and I'm um, still positive. Awesome. So, awesome. Uh, Actually, you know, Mark, the, you brought up something super that I think we've never discussed, and, and I want to, um, and I want to bring Ches in here, uh, but level two, so you, you were paying for them so you could try to teach yourself level twos. Did I understand that right? Yeah, it was an absolute massacre. Yeah. I, Ches, I don't know about you, but I, when he said that, I had like flashbacks about I remember the first time I ever tried to figure out level twos and stuff like it. That's that's weird. That's like intimidating. It's confusing. What does all that stuff mean? Did you kind of relate to that too, Chez? Totally. And I think and I don't know if that's just and I don't know what the reason is. Maybe it's because it's what we see in live trade videos and people are showing stuff and, you know, you see screenshots, of these big trader screens and, you know, how many level twos they have. But I was the same way when I got interested in trading. I thought my main focus and the way to actually make money was not necessarily the chart. It was, you know, find support in the level two and, you know, find resistance in the level two. And, but yeah, right when you kind of dive into that, I was the same way. I had, you know, it's, you struggle very much until you go to kind of either stocks that are illiquid or just mud stocks like Bank of America, BAC, that, you know, move a couple pennies here and there. But, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, especially coming in as a new thing. I don't know why that is, though. But yeah, as a new trader, I was fascinated with it. And I actually spent probably much more time on it than I needed to um, because, you know, there's much more that goes into trading than just reading that level, too. Yeah, but I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm with you, Mark, man. I, I Like I said, you caused a flashback. I remember looking at stuff. What is that? Wait, what? Market maker? Wait, what do these numbers mean? Why is that color doing that? I mean, it was just now I look at it. And I, I say that's not to brag, but just to show that, you know, if you're feeling like I am right now, trust me, there's hope for you because if I can figure it out, anybody can. But now I look and say, oh, wow, yeah, this stuff is so easy. Yeah, it all makes so much sense. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boom, boom, boom. But man, I mean, when I first, oh, I, so I can totally relate there in terms of you trying to figure it out and paying for it. And like, yeah, that's that's just a, that's a mess. So, um, yeah, good little talking point there. So sorry to cut you off, but, you know, we've never... Like I said, you caused that flashback, so I'm I'm almost sitting here curling up into a little ball, sucking my thumb. But I'm, I'll I'll try to be strong for you guys. Okay, so I uh, I went from the level two quotes. I learned it. Um, you know, I started now. I was now I'm looking at level two quotes as the market's going, and uh, ex specifically the dilution. I'm in the I'm in a chat room on Facebook. I see some people talking about some stuff. Actually, this was recent, and. Uh, I see it's the ticker symbol is GBSN, GBSN. It was trading at like a dollar or something. And somebody came on and they were like, they're pouring some Kool-Aid to these poor fellas and they were all this, buying. This was a, a Facebook chat room? You said this was this is def definitely not the inner circle chat room, right? No, definitely not the inner circle. Okay, Facebook, I was going to say, Facebook. band yeah. time, but yeah, I was. <laughs> uh... No, uh, so yeah. This guy was saying, oh, they're going to do this, that, and the other, and it's going to be a great, everybody's going to be able to sell at $2, and uh, I was looking at the level twos, you know, just for entertainment, and um, market maker EDGX, I believe is what it was, oh, an insane amount of shares were just getting dumped into it, and then all of a sudden the bid would just disappear, and then more shares are piled on the ask, and well, if you look at it now, it's trading around like twenty nine cents, and the the people are still like, "Hey, when are we gonna get it? When are we gonna, you know, when's it gonna happen?" And uh, I actually ended up getting kicked out of that room because of me. I was saying, "Don't buy it. You're gonna you're gonna lose a ton of money. It's getting diluted. It's getting diluted. Do you not know how to use level twos? But you're buying this thing anyway." And then so they kicked me, unfortunately. So is it, is it safe to say that uh, the, the money spent on the level two course saved you way more than you would have lost if you didn't understand what was going on? Oh, yeah. I wouldn't have bought it anyway. I, I really use those groups for entertainment, uh, honestly, throughout the day because it's just so funny that these people will uh, come in here and they use the losing money in the market as an excuse to learning the market. It doesn't work like that. They think it does, but they think they can lose the money and learn from it, but which doesn't make any sense. Why not just pay for the quality education? Yeah, I'm trying to think right now. 
that logic there, but I'm, I'm, yeah. Cheza, are you following? That seems like flawed logic, doesn't it? Right. I mean, if you want to play tennis, you're going to be bad at first. And you, I get it. You have to play a bunch of hours. But at the same time, you know, you don't have a finite. OK, sure. You have a finite amount of physical energy activity throughout, you know, 80 years of your active life. But, yeah, I think money is going to go and fly out a lot faster than you losing a couple games of tennis. Um, and, you know, the whole 10,000 hours things to get to get things right. Don't get me wrong. You're going to need, you will probably, you know, I think almost we'll all spend 10,000 hours looking at charts, but can do you have enough money to sustain you for those 10,000 hours is where a lot of people are going to say no, including myself. I, I bet you say just about anybody in here would say they do not have enough money to do that. So yeah, I get what they're trying to say, but it's nowhere even close to working in a market So it's flawed logic unless you have a money tree growing out back. Yep, and you know if you you have one of those, please let me know where I can find the seeds for a money tree as well. Yes, please mail those to uh, claytrader.com, PO Box, um, Somalia. <laughs> so for you yeah. tinfoil hats out there that think you'll you'll get that joke reference. But anyways, all right, Mark. So you're you're trading. You know level twos. Uh, were you, had you joined uh, Clay Trader University at this point or no? Oh yeah, I went all in. And okay, so, all in. so you when you went all in, you went all in. You didn't like test the water or anything. Oh no, I knew I needed to do it. You know, I was just back because I was not losing money, but I wasn't gaining money because I was just going up and then I was going down. I was going up and I was going down. Um, I never let a big loss, you know, wipe my entire account out. Uh, and then I'd have some gains come in. So I knew if I needed to be consistent, if I wanted to be consistent and I wanted to actually give this thing my full go, I needed to step up my education. And okay. The free so, stuff went good. Nice, nice. So we were talking beforehand, and I know we were talking in email. Uh, but I know you're big into ETFs and leverage ETFs and ETNs and all that stuff. So when did that when did that piece kind of start to you know appear into your big puzzle? Let's see. That would uh that would be. I don't know. I kind of just found myself floating in that direction. You know, the leverage makes it real nice. I like that it's commodity. It's not real affected by news or at least news that is unknown. You know, there's a certain amount of fundamental fundamentals there too that you can kind of trade off of and I like that idea too uh, but I use the technical side of the uh, training to actually look at the chart of the commodity or whatever it is that I'm trading at you know the ETNs I don't know that you can really use a chart effectively on it uh, just because it's there, you know, there's so much risk involved with the ETN or ETF um, as defined by the market you know Right, but I, I'm gonna. I want to step back just slightly now. So you you go full blown into Clay Trader University. How did that affect your trading immediately? Did you become a millionaire trading these ETFs right away, or you know what 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 happened after you kind of got educated? Of course, you became a millionaire. That's all it takes. Sign up for Clay Trader University. ClayTrader.com, guys. Be sure and then uh, next day you go buy it. yourself a Lamborghini. It'll change That's your right. life, Garrett. Yeah. Absolutely not a millionaire. Oh uh, what? Oh well, then you're terrible. I mean, what's your problem, man? But you know what I didn't do? I didn't lose. I didn't wipe. I didn't let one trade wipe out my gains. That's what was important to me. Um, I'm slowly, you know, slow. It's a. It's not a race. I'm not racing in this thing. Uh, I don't trade every single day. Even I, I, if I see something I like, then I'll trade it. But I do watch every day naturally. But uh, like Monday, I didn't enter a trade. Uh, the thirty first, didn't enter a trade. So. There was just nothing I liked, so that's and how well, I go. You, you, you know? did, you did make a trade because people always forget that not making a trade is a trade because sometimes that's the best trade you can make. So that's don't, true. I don't, I don't, force. don't shortcut yourself. You, you made good, you make good trades when you don't make trades when you're not supposed to make a trade. If that make, hopefully that makes sense. But yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, and I forget it too. You know, cash position is a position, right? If you're just all, in all cash. Then you're saying, you know what? Nothing fits my criteria out there, and there's nothing wrong with that. Now, of course, if you want to make money as a trader, eventually you got to get out of cash posi cash positions. But like you said, uh, you don't trade every day, and, and that's perfectly fine. Um, so that's kind of a good segue into this. But I mean, what are you know, what are kind of some of your favorite setup strategies? What do you like to look for in order for you to want to actually make a trade? Oh, the falling knife! Oh my goodness, the falling knife! Uh, I love it. It it will hurt you. But goodness, it can, you just, you gotta, you know how it is. I mean, the falling knife, it's so tempting not to buy it, not to try to catch it, whether you're shorting or buying. 
Uh, I'm all over the falling knives, and the commodities tend to do that a lot. So I really like to trade them uh, and try to take advantage of that. Explain a little bit more what a falling knife is, because there's going to be some people listening that may have no idea what you mean by a falling knife. So, um, you know, describe that. You know, describe that for those for okay. our listeners. Uh, so basically, what, what you're trying to do is you're trying to catch the bottom or catch the top, short the top or uh, by the bottom. And the way you would do that is by looking at the chart and just trying to see, okay, well, they, look, there's a moving average right here, and it meets the Bollinger Band. That might be a sort of uh, support, so I might be able to buy right there. And so a lot of times what I'll do is if I see uh, something dipping down and it gets, I'll put my, I'll put it right just below it, you know, just below it, try to let it break through there, because then I think I'm really, my, my risk versus reward is really good. If I can put it under there, and because a lot of times you'll see them just dip under and then kind of like rubber band back up. So I try to take advantage of that setup a lot. Um and I, ha- I have pretty good, pretty good trades with it. Well, well, you and nailed uh, it. I mean, the, the risk versus reward. Assuming you know how to implement that, is going to be there for those. Um, but also, just to kind of uh, assist Mark there, uh, a falling knife is pretty much the price. Let's just say is at I don't know. These are just made up numbers. Fifty one dollars, and then within in the span of I don't know five minutes, it's fifty one dollars down to you know fifty dollars and twenty five cents. I mean, in a very quick amount of time, the price just starts to drop. And drop and drop, uh, and and Mark, you know, he likes to try to catch that falling knife. Meaning, he likes to try to buy uh, at a strategic location where his risk makes sense relative to his reward, and uh, you know, uh, you know, take profits from that. And um, and you've been doing pretty good with that, huh? Because a lot of people struggle with that one. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, it, it's like I said. I, I try to make the trade work for me in a sense that okay, I think I'm going to buy here, but I'm gonna, I wouldn't be surprised if it did pull back a little bit further, you know, because people kind of like I, I, you'll see it on level twos all the time because the people just start loading the boat and the shares will just you'll see all the shares just sitting on the bed waiting to be, uh, you know, waiting to change hands, and, and by then it's too late. You're just you're out of luck. It's way too late. So I wanted to you know it's. So it's an interesting predicament that, you know, you said you never had any blowout losses. That's just kind of a, you know, not to offend anybody that we've had previously as podcast guests. It's just generally newer traders struggle with emotions and they get tied to positions when they go against them. And, you know, we're, we're very quick to cut our winners very short and we're very, you know, we'll hold the loser until we're right. That's just part of the human psyche. But, um, you know, how did taking a loser back then compare mentally to how you know you feel when you take losers now because i think you know we, we usually get some interesting answers on this but you never experience or kind of let yourself take those blowout losses so first off kudos to you for having a lot more discipline than i ever did um but yeah i want to hear kind of you know how does that contrast from then to now okay so uh, a, a big part of it i mean you know i take some losses i'll take some uh everybody takes them whoever says they don't take them they're just talking through their teeth uh, but I look at it as a learning experience. I look at it as I was wrong. Um, but you're whenever. a terrible trader if you're wrong, right? I mean, <laughs> doesn't that mean you're a bad trader if you're wrong? Oh, no. No, no every, not everybody's right all the time. And everybody, you know, everybody will always talk about how they'll always, everybody talks about the winners, but everybody has losers. Like that one, I took a $600 loss, you know, in 2014, late in 2014. That's a big loss. Uh, I learned from it. I learned that I uh, held on to it way too long, and I uh, I didn't use a stop. I didn't even use a mental stop, and I ended up just selling it uh, at actually near the bottom. Actually, sold it near the bottom, and uh, I, I look at all my losses as a learning experience. I try to keep them relatively small. The other day, I posted one in the in the um, inner circle, and it was bad, and you got on to me about it, and uh, I've learned from it. But, you know, I mean, what can you do? Everybody, Everybody's going to have some losing trades. Just, just got to make more than you win. I mean, make more than you lose. Yeah, exactly. And, um, I mean, but also, would you agree with this? I mean, winning, winners are, are, are learning experiences too, right? Oh, certainly. Because you could certainly. win, but you could do everything wrong in the book, and the only reason you won was pure luck. So, um, you, I mean, you can relate to that, right? Because I know new people are listeners. They're, they probably think, ah, the only time I can learn is from a, a loser. But um, I think the winners are some of the, the bigger times when you can even learn. Would you, would you agree with that? Oh, yeah. 
Oh, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, so keep that in mind. When you're out there and winning, just because you win, it doesn't mean you did everything right. And also keep in mind, just because you lost, it didn't mean you did something wrong. Sometimes you can do everything right and it's still a loss. And hey, that's part of the game. That's part of this business we're in. So, you know, it, it's a, a line that gets blurred, uh, you know, way, way too often. So, but now, I mean, so these falling nights when they're happening, when you're wrong, I mean, you just psychologically, you're just like, hey, I was wrong. See you later. Or do you still kind of struggle with taking the loss on, you know, we'll use the falling knife as an example? Um, yeah, I, I still struggle, um, you know, because. I'm so sure that I, I'm, I'm sure enough to put my money where my mouth is, where I'm thinking it, it's going to happen. So it's a struggle. I mean, it really is, you know, but got to do it. I don't want one loss to blow me up because it'll happen. I mean, but, I, I've talked to people that it happens too. Okay. So, I mean, you haven't had any, I mean, you've been doing a good job of, of, of minimizing risk. Sure, it still stings and sure, it's still hard, but you've you've been doing a good job, right? Exactly. Yeah. So do you Hold have any? I games. mean, so this is. I mean, this. I'm. I'm interested here because okay, you're still struggling, but you're doing a good job of doing it. So that that's good. But so, are, how are you kind of tricking yourself? Like, to, I mean, do you have any tips or tricks on how you're mentally being able to be good at something that you you know don't really want to do? If that makes sense. Let's see. So. Or I uh, mean, is it, is it easy as just sitting there saying, "Look, Mark, I don't want to lose a ton of money," so. I know the little voice in my head right now says, hold, 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 but I'm, or is, is it, I mean, I don't know. I'm just curious. How, how are you psychologically tricking yourself to do this? Well, whenever I go to, you know, if I see the red just start piling up on the position, I'm just thinking, okay, well, I like to talk to myself. Okay, well, there goes, you know, here, this is where I need to get out. I need to get out right here. I need to wait for this next little bounce up, try to get out as soon as I can, you know, when it makes sense. I mean, naturally, every situation is different. There may not be a bounce anywhere in sight, or there very well could be some resistance, I mean, some support just a little lower or some resistance to get it moving around again. So, uh, you know, uh, depends on the situation, but I always come back and I say, okay, I don't, do I really want to let this trade wipe out my gains? Is it worth it? You know, is it worth me going to be, is it worth me being stubborn enough to let this trade possibly wipe out all my gains that I've had, you know, over the last month, over the last two months or whatever? So... That's how I like to look at it, just like that. Yeah, so, I mean, honestly, guys, you're, you're just a bunch of good knowledge being dropped in this podcast. And I love just doing these podcasts. It's just great to hear from, uh, you know, fellow students such as myself. But, um, you know, do you Especially have any— Especially these young whippersnappers, the ripe yeah. age of 23. I mean, this yeah. guy's got so much time in front of him. It's crazy. He's gonna, he's gonna be in the markets for a long time, especially with a good mindset and you know, man, you know, emphasis on managing risk and not blowing out for sure. But um, now, do you have any? Would you say you had any rituals or routines that you kind of you you do or you have kind of before you're putting trades on? You know, do you have certain things you'll do at the computer or certain things you'll do for preparation, anything like that? Oh yes. So at night, a lot of times, what I like to do right before I go to bed, you know, I'll check and see what the futures are gonna be, uh, how the futures look. I'll see what the commodities are doing overnight overseas, and um, uh, then I'll check again in the morning, and I'll just kind of scroll through. I'll scroll through the chat and see if anybody's learning anything in the inner circle. You know, see what anybody's talking about, see what the buzz is about, and uh, then I'll, I'll go and look and see what the commodities are doing right before the open. Because a lot of times that's when you'll see them gapping up or gapping down, is uh, right before the open or in the pre-market even. And you can really take advantage of some stuff right there. Uh, so that's what I try to do. Do you mean you're, you're trading pre-market? Is that what you mean by take well, advantage of things? No, uh, initiate, the, you know, get in the trade, enter the tra trade, and then look to exit, you know, later on once the market opens. Is whenever normally the moves will take place, whether it be up or down. Okay, so, so the futures are, um, they play a, a pretty intricate or important role in your, uh, you know, just main trades too. You're always keeping an eye on those. Yeah, because I, sometimes I'll go trade Facebook. You know, I'll trade Twitter, some small caps even here and there. Um, but typically, I really like to mess with those ETNs because they're leveraged, and I like the idea of the you know times two and times three velocity. So I what try a, to stick around there. Nice. So uh, what are some of these ticker symbols that you're trading? And full disclosure, I mean, if you're listening to this podcast a year from now. Who knows? Maybe these ETFs aren't around, so you're not doing anything right if you type these up and, and go search for them, and they're not there. So, uh, but I mean, currently at the time of this recording, you know, Mark, what are some of those? Uh, what do you look? What do you like to trade? I know some of them, but I don't want to. 
I don't want to rain on your parade. Yeah, and before I name them off, I would also like to uh, talk about how they are extremely risky. Um, you know, there's so much risk involved, and anybody that thinks about trading them should really look into that before they do. With that said, um, UGAS, UWTI, uh, DWTI, JNUG, JDST, um, you got SPY. I don't really trade that one a whole lot. I've never heard of that one before. SPY? Yeah, that was a bad joke. Sorry. Chez, oh. at, at least Chez could have laughed. Uh, humor me a little I, bit here. I'm struggling. I just gave yeah. you a stern look because... Yeah, you did. You just wagged your finger at me and said... Yeah, yeah I'm pretty sure you traded the other day. There was good effort. There was good effort. Was ah, good wow. Effort. I'm just going to shut my mouth the rest of this interview after that debacle. Um, so why are they so risky? I mean, you gave a nice little disclosure. Um, that, that's very kind of you, and I appreciate that. But, I mean, what makes these so risky? Uh, uh, they're leveraged investments, and they really, they really just track, like, debt. It's kind of confusing what, they, what you're actually buying. Uh, each one's kind of different, I've seen, but sometimes it's unsecured debt um, for, like, brokerage houses to use to be able to short or go long or whatever the commodity may be. So it's kind of... Kind of, you know, it's a little gray area right there. So and in, they in, move. in other words, they move quickly. So you can be up a whole lot of money, which is nice. But with high risk comes high reward. So just because you have that high reward, because they can move very quickly in your favor, they can also move very quickly against you. Is that pretty much what we're getting at here? Is they're oh, very, very yeah. fast movers. Oh yeah, something trading for like a dollar and seventy nine cents, like you gas or something. Uh, can quickly be at you know a dollar and eighty five in a blink of an eye, just out of nowhere. Yep. You don't you don't even see it. It just all of a sudden. Yeah, it's crazy. I remember uh, back during two thousand eight, two thousand nine, when the financial system was collapsing. Um, you know, I traded SKF, FAZ, FAS, and those things were just. Uh, Mark is not exaggerating. Those things back then. I mean, no joke, they could be at 58 bucks, and then all of a sudden, in the blink of an eye, they're at, you know, 59 and a half. Then all of a sudden, they're at 62. I mean, it was a, it was crazy back then. Granted, that was a total an economic meltdown. But, yeah, um, that's, a, that, that's a really good disclosure on his part. Uh, I mean, if you're brand new, um, should you start off with leveraged ETFs? Probably not. I, I, Chez, can I get your back up there? Would you agree with me? You know what? I wish they had 10x leverage products that people could trade because that would be a great beginner product. Yes, I completely agree that it's not something beginners want to just hop right into blind. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a risky, risky thing. Um, now, as we kind of start to wrap things up and get closer, um, I like we've, uh, for whatever reason, I mean, this wasn't planned, but we've been talking a lot about you know, the mind and psyche and all that stuff. So, I mean, what kind of personality traits do you think are associated with, you know, uh, what does it take to be, you know, a, a successful trader? What does it take to even stay in the game as a trader from a, you know, kind of a personality and personality trait perspective? I would say you have to be patient and you have to be willing to learn. I mean, you, you know, you can't just think that you're going to wake up one day. Basically, you can't dream. There's no dreaming in the market. I like to go back to that. Uh, you can't just dream about it. Yeah, you, you have to do it. You have to practice it. You, you do have to paper trade. You know, you gotta, you gotta do all these things. You gotta learn. Uh, listen to what people say that you can trust. You know, eventually you you're able to. You can't just get on, on Facebook and listen to everybody you see, but you know who makes money and who doesn't, and that's who you need to listen to. Don't paper trade them. Don't I mean don't trade off of them, but you can at least learn from them. Like I've learned tons of things from like uh, Hooch and Gator and everybody in the in the room, and naturally off of your live videos that you have that you post on YouTube. That's where I've learned so much just in terminology there. And uh, it's great. You know, it's a great resource just to talk to knowledgeable people. Hooch is episode number two of the podcast. Gator is episode number four in case uh, you want to go back and listen to their journeys. But FYI. Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's very refreshing to hear, like I said, you know, a lot of some people come to the market strictly looking for quick riches. And we always tell people if they come into the chat room or talk to us on Twitter, um, you know, if you want to do that, you're better off going to Vegas. You know, Mark over here, he understands and he's willing to want to learn. This is kind of, you know, it's not a race like you said earlier. Um, it's a long-term game and, you know, you, you're only trying to better yourself. And, you know, the better you get and the more time you, you put into it and the more effort you put in and kind of learning, um, you know, the better the results get. And like you said, you know, those people who are here for those quick gains and stuff like that, you see who will last and who won't. 
and you just want to surround yourself with uh, you know people who are who are doing well and have put in the time and you know excelling in what they do. But uh, I know you I, talk. I do want to. Ch- I, just, I got to piggyback off that. You know, people get in the market for quick gains, and you know, let's be honest, let's be upfront. People will get those quick gains. People get quick gains. However, however, the but, but the true talent, the true skill in this craziness we call trading is keeping those gains. We've all been there. I've made quick gains. A lot of people have made quick gains. That's and so get, true. See, I, I showed up in the market for quick gains. I got my quick gains. Uh, and I hear that all the time and people ease my email and I have my, my simple standard response. Hey, congrats on your gains. Now the hard part begins keeping those gains and hanging on to them. So yeah, do that for five more years. Do that for 10 more years and you know, check back with me by email. And a lot of them you'll never hear back from again in like a month or two. As fast as it comes, you know, that fool's gold as fast as it comes in is as fast as it's going to go out. So I know you touched on a lot, you know, you're very, very open about what you perceive as your weaknesses and, you know, what you could, um, you know, work on. But what, what would you say are your strengths right now um, in your trading? My strengths would, my strengths would be speed. Um, you know, as far as, you know, I don't make any fat finger trades, like I like to call it, you know, if you enter the wrong order or anything like that. I'm really good at moving on the spot, entering my order, getting it entered good, and uh, reading the chart again. It's my multiple time frames too. I have two monitors, so I'm able to uh, really compare what I'm trading with um, across different times, and, and um, uh, also reading level twos. You know, doing a bunch of things like that at once. I really think that's a good strength of mine and discipline. Discipline for sure. Nice. Discipline's nice. Yeah. No. That's discipline, one. as Ches has already, you know, echoed. I mean, you've uh, you, you're kind of the exception in that in that sense of you've always kind of. You know, nobody likes to take a loss, but you've uh, kind of been very good at that ever since you even got here. Out of curiosity, on your chart, I mean, what are your, some of your favorite indicators? What's what is on your chart? I mean, do you have eight million indicators, or are you more one of the no, simple no. type things? I mean, wh- what are you looking at on a daily basis? I'm very simple. Uh, naturally, I have my level twos. I have the three minute, five minute, ten minute, fifteen minute, and daily. That sometimes I swap out to a thirty minute, and uh, I have the Bollinger Bands and I have a 10 minute, 10 day moving average. Sometimes I'll change the moving average around on different charts. You know, it just depends on what I'm doing, what I'm looking at. Just want to see if I, something else matches up, you know. But it's pretty standard as far as I keep it with the 10. And I'm assuming you have candlesticks and volume bars, right? Oh, yeah, and the candlesticks and volume, yes. So you don't have, do you have RSI? No, I don't even have RSI. MACD? Sometimes I'll turn it on. No, not even MACD. Uh, I might turn it on. What are some of the other popular ones out there, Chez, that a lot of people think you absolutely need? Um, the Ichimoku cloud. <laughs> <laughs> so, in other words, for our listeners, what I'm trying to get across is, uh, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong. Maybe some people are awesome with 8 million different indicators and overlays on their chart, but, I mean, Mark, he, he's a simple man, and charting does not need to be, uh, it does not need to be a laser light show. Um, so, you know, keep that in mind. Well, as we start to wrap things up, uh, just because I know you have uh, some experience with penny stocks and you get a kick out of uh, kind of going and seeing, you know, just hanging out in chat rooms or whatever. Uh, if somebody were to come up to you and say, hey, Mark, I got a hot stock pick for you, you know, what would your response be? Oh, I would have to tell them that uh, I'd like to know what it is just so that I could follow it, just to see everybody that they told them. But I would be no way interested in buying it at all. I just, I haven't traded a penny stock. And I really don't consider the ETNs penny stocks either just because they trade hundreds of millions of dollars a day. So I wouldn't even be interested in buying it. But I would definitely watch it. So you would watch it. But what happens if the chart looked really good? Uh, I, I still I still wouldn't. I, I don't know. I mean, if it looks super good, I might put a small position. But I haven't done that since. I haven't traded a penny stock since February. So. But you would, when you say you would watch it, you mean you would watch it through the chart, right? Through the chart and level twos? Yeah, I might, you know, check on it and just see how everybody's doing, see if they're complaining or what's, what, they're, what they're doing, you know, that type of thing. Just comedy. So my, my, the point here that I'm trying to get in that Mark is saying without really saying it is because he's been educated, because he's invested into his education, notice how his, you know, the, the, the timeline didn't go, Mark gets hot stock pick, Mark goes and buys stock. It is Mark gets hot stock pick. Marks goes and watches it. In other words, he checks out the level twos, checks out the chart, and then makes decisions. And he said, yeah, you know what? 99% of the time, I'm probably not going to buy it. But too many people, they, they, you know, oh, Google search, 
free hot stock picks and my all I got to do is submit my email and then somebody emails them a hot stock pick and their timeline goes get email or wait sign up for email get email buy stock I mean that's if that's not a sheep in a puppets game I don't know what is so good answer Mark I'm glad you didn't say I would run out and buy it uh, if that was going <laughs> to the case uh we're, me and Chaz are gonna have to come rough you up where are you at by the way Louisiana. I was gonna say you got a little twang in your uh, in your accent or in your oh, voice. Oh yeah. I guess so, Louisiana. So LSU Tigers. All the way. All right. Well, we're getting way off topic. We got we got to wrap up. Then we'll get to the fun stuff. Um, but Chez, believe it or not, he has a time machine. I Him do. And Hooch and Gator and Wilson and some other people. They they invented it. Um, so if he gave that to you and you could go back to the very start, uh, you know what what is one bit of advice you would give yourself? Oh, as much as it's going to sound like a plug, I would have signed up for the uh, Clay Trail University a long time ago. Uh, I'm probably going to have to pay capital gains tax this year. Boom. And I think that's, that's a great awesome, man. Thing. Congratulations. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's a good problem to have. Yes. yes. It's not <laughs> paying taxes, but it's a good problem to have. Remember, that is the goal to everybody out there. Yeah. You want to pay taxes as a trader. Everybody complains about paying taxes when I don't think it's a bad thing at all, honestly. I mean, it's no fun, but yeah. It's just uh, it's just a part of being here. But um, now this next question will really determine, you know, first off, if we air this podcast, and second off, if we do, you know, have to ban you from uh, from the community. But uh, Clay wants to know, what is your favorite movie? Oh, Chez, Chez. We didn't ask the final question. Three words, man. That's your question. You get to ask him that. Uh, I, I think get- we've I think we've switched that up before. If not, I'm going to be a genuine or a generous person here. I'm pretty well, sure, though. If somebody wants to leave in the comment section below, I'm pretty sure that I've let Chez ask this question before. So I'm going to call him ahead. out right now. If he is lying on air, call him out in the in the sector in the comments. <laughs> you section. you have you have. I won't even fight you on that. But, All right, uh, fantastic. There, Anyways, was ask him that, words, and then we'll go to the fun questions. If there was three words you had to pick to kind of describe what you think uh, is involved in being a su- successful stock trader, what do you think those three words would be? I would say self-control, uh, patience, and discipline. And I, I think self-control and discipline are different. I how think so? they do have a. How so? Uh, I'm, I'm uh, not disagreeing with you, but I, I think this could be a, a nice little talking point. Self-control is the uh, whenever you go to buy. You know, you're not you're not going to force the trade. I mean, I guess you could call it discipline, but really, self-control. Whenever you're going to go buy, whenever you're going to sell, you're selling for a good reason. You're buying for a reason, and uh, then discipline. I really like to think about discipline as getting out, stopping yourself out. You're going to lose money, you know. Not thinking you're gonna, it's going to bounce back up. You know, that's whenever you're getting out. That's what I like to think about it. No, I think that's that's great because now, okay, now that I'm thinking about it, prices going up, prices going up. Oh man, I really want to buy. I really want to buy. Self control is the, you know, the the resistance to the urge to chase. But then, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. And then discipline, like you said. Is when you're in, now you just need to be, you know, willing to honor the plan. And in order to honor the plan, it's going to take some discipline because sometimes the plan it just turns out to be a loss, and it is what it is. So yeah, that, a nice little. Uh, see, Ches, aren't you glad that you asked that question? If you, I am. Just, it is such a good question too. I mean, you're just Ches. What what would I do without you? Honestly, what would I do without you? I I just don't. Place know. would fall apart. That's for sure. It would. It would, it would fall to pieces. Now you can ask him the the the. the uh, we were actually talking beforehand, and Mark is prepared for these questions. So, Chez, throw him the first one. So, Clay, I should hand it back to you, but I'm going to take it anyways because I'm a greedy person. But Clay wants to know, what is your favorite movie? I really like the casino. The casino movie. Uh, let's see. That, I don't know any quotes from that, but that's the, like the mafia one, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm in Vegas. It's With a really Joe good Pesci. movie. Joe Pesci, right? Exactly. Okay, yeah. And uh, uh, why can't I? Uh, what's the main guy's name from uh, Meet the Parents? De Niro, right? Yes. R- Robert. Yes. Okay, yeah. Robert De Niro. Okay, yeah, yeah. Good movie. I watch what it a- every time it comes on. So you're one of these Saturday afternoon type movie guys. I really don't watch a whole lot of movies, honestly. Um, I, I just I don't know. I, I don't watch a whole lot of movies, but if I see it, you know, I'm sitting on the couch, I watch it. Nice, Why nice, not? nice. Um, when you're flipping between that and the Housewives of Atlanta or whatever those shows are called, <laughs> is, is that, quite, a, is that even quite. a show, Ches? Or did I just total? Are we gonna have to cut that out of the episode? No, I, I, that's probably a show. I don't actually I think watch it's a that reality much show. That was, yeah, uh, that was another bad joke. I am, 
ice cold in this. I, not that I'm ever, ever funny, but man, I'm extra it's, bad. Uh, it has to do with your food intake today. I can assure <laughs> you that's what's throwing you off. Yeah, probably, probably. Uh, what about your favorite meal, speaking of food? What do you like to eat? And then what do you like to follow it up with in terms of dessert? Uh, let's see. So naturally, I'm a guy. Steak. I love steak. Love cheeseburgers. Uh, make that steak medium rare, and it's hard for me to stay away from it. Um, then to follow it up, cheesecake, but I also like crawfish. I'm uh, in Louisiana. I forgot to mention that. Crawfish, boiled crawfish. If you've never had crawfish, I know y'all are from all over the place. you got to get you some boiled crawfish. And none of that Chinese buffet stuff either. You have to come to Louisiana, and you have to get some Louisiana crawfish. All right, I have a question on that topic. Um, so IT Nate, who I guess is the producer of this podcast, I don't even know what his title is in terms of this podcast, but he does, he puts it all together and makes it sound pretty, but he went down to Louisiana to help his buddy move. They picked up crawfish cause I've always wanted to try them. So they got them fresh and then he brought them back to me and I had them like two or three days later. And I don't know, I was kind of like, ah, what's, is that, should I just have them fresh? Did I kind of not give myself a, a good chance there by, you know, eating them three days l- l- You need later. to have them fresh. Yeah, you need fresh. to have them fresh. Yeah, you really can't. You can't refrigerate them and try to eat them. Now, you can make an etouffee with them or something or I jumble no out. I don't know what that is, but point being here, just eat them <laughs> fresh, so I should give them another try, but make sure they're fresh. Absolutely. I think All you'll right. be very satisfied. All right. We'll, what we'll about, do that uh, next, uh, next Clay Trader uh, meetup we have. We'll have it somewhere down south at some point. We'll that's do that. not a bad idea. That's right. not a bad we'll idea a at all. All fish whatever you call those things, a crawfish get-together, I guess. Um, what about your favorite song or band? Uh, classic rock in general, you know? Classic rock, uh, Led Zeppelin, uh, everybody like that. And I uh, really also like country, new age and old. Um, nothing in particular. I'll listen to anything that comes on the radio pretty much as far as classic rock and country. Cool, cool. Now, what's a place you'd like to visit someday, ideally one you haven't been to before? I would have to say I'd I'd be I'd be totally down to go to Australia. I would also like to go to the New York Stock Exchange, but I wouldn't like to use that one trip on that. Uh, but Australia, I think, would be very fun. I just hear everything tries to kill you, so I'd be very careful. <laughs> Australia is no joke. I mean, you go swimming, you got great whites. If you got yeah, kangaroos are trying to chase you down. It's crazy. It's crazy. Not that I've ever been there. But uh, what about hobbies? What do you like to do for fun? Anything that involves water, on the water, uh, you know, fishing, uh, on the, just swimming, boat, anything that involves boats and water, anything really. Awesome, and awesome. So stocks. you like to go like skiing and stuff like that too? Oh yeah, it's all a good time. All a good time. Now you go out in the water down in Louisiana, don't you guys have like poisonous snakes all over the place? Sort of, sort of, and alligators, but no, it's not like what I mean. I've watched Duck Dynasty. I see what's yeah. going on down there. There's it's not what you see on there. And, I will never go swimming in a lake in the South ever because there's poisonous snakes everywhere. That's why I love Lake Michigan. There's nothing poisonous anywhere close. So I don't know, Mark. I'm scared for you, man. I'm scared for you. You going? There's rattlesnakes all over the place and water moccasins. Aren't you scared? It's seasonal. They're seasonal. <laughs> seasonal. That's what they tell you. That's what they tell you. Anyways, Mark, I uh, had a very good time. As you can see, I could keep on talking and giving you a hard time, but we need to uh, start to bring this to a close. So thank you very much um, for hanging out with us right now as we're doing the recording. It's the evening time, so I appreciate you uh, you know, hanging out with us, uh, especially after I know you work today. Um, so thank you very much. No problem, no problem. And to all our listeners out there, if you enjoyed the podcast and you're listening to this at claytrader.com, uh, please click that share button, leave a comment below. Um, we, Chez and I, we read all the comments. I'm sure Mark would be willing to, uh, answer any questions you may have for him down in the comment section. So, uh, please do that. If you're listening to this on iTunes, leave us a review, uh, leave us a, a five star rating and, uh, you know, l- little things like that really do go a long way. So thank you again to Mark. Thank you to you as a listener, and we'll see you back for the next episode. This has been the stock trading reality podcast. Thanks for taking the time to hang out. To learn more about Clay and the Clay Trader community, including the trading team, premium training, and more, visit claytrader.com.